This is our third week of Love Story. And uh, through the first three, two weeks, we walked through the first two chapters and a couple verses of chapter 3 of Song of Solomon. So if this is your first week, there's good news. You can catch up. There's good stuff there. Um, there's some CDs at the back or it's online if you'd like to watch and keep, keep up. But just as a quick recap on some things that we focused on is the first week we talked about is to have the right relationship, you have to be the right person. It's, it's a heart check. It's, a, it's an individual thing in a lot of ways for us to be the right person in order to find the right person. It's an attraction issue there. The second week, we focused on our love problem, and we talked about our desires typically outrun our commitments, and we talked about how we try to get shortcuts to get what we want faster. We also said that it's important that we, we get a solid foundation, but many times we're in too much of a hurry, and so we don't set a solid foundation. We focus much more on our pleasure than the person in our relationships. And the fifth thing we talked about is a, is a love problem. In, in Song of Solomon 2, there's, there's this little phrase about the foxes, the little foxes. We don't remove, we don't take the time to remove the little barriers that become bigger issues. We don't take care of the little foxes. But the good news is we kind of set up some solutions, some love solutions, as it were. The first one we, we decided, we talked about together, was to follow Jesus. You've got to have that relationship first and foremost. That's got to be the first thing. The second thing is we have to reduce our pool. That's our potential for dating. And, and, and evidently the, the, the funny part of that became, you know, we, we, we take our, our, our pool of possibilities and turn it into a hot tub of our marriage, right? That's, 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 that's who, who our, our pool is reduced to, the, the hot tub of our, our marriage, that one person. The third thing we talked about is we need to have predetermined standards. We need to write them down, say them out loud. The fourth thing we said was to date for a mate, date for the purpose of marriage, not just as a recreational sport. There's not an Olympic gold medal for dating. The fifth thing we talked about was having a verbal commitment, and we would see that today in our society as the marriage ceremony where he says and she says and we, I do, and kiss and all that kind of good stuff. We, we express that verbally and publicly. And then the last thing we talked about is the, the solution, the love solution, is intimacy after marriage. See, this, this helps us see the order that allows us to address the love problem. True love has a proper place and a, a proper pl pace. Healthy relationships follow a healthy and holy process. And I would, I, would, I would think that each and every one of us here would agree that that's what we want. We want healthy, holy, happy relationships. No one says, hey, I want to have a crummy, sorry, awful relationship. Nobody says that. But in order to, to live out what you say that you want, you have to put the building blocks in place. And throughout Song of Solomon, we see this interaction between this couple and we see how they lay a firm and solid foundation based upon their, their set standards for what relationship needs to look like. Their set standards, what they believe is godly in their relationship. Today we take another step. Today we rejoice in the holy matrimony. We celebrate marriage and, and we even catch a glimpse of the moment of knowledge. We get a, get a, get a little insight into the intimate connection between man and wife. This past Friday night in our, in our church, we had a, a Valentine's banquet, and we had uh, couples that came, and this is always one of my favorite times of the year because we have such a cross-section of people that come. It's not just all of the 20-somethings or the 50-somethings or the 30-somethings. It's, it's, it's truly a, a, a smorgasbord, if you will, of, of our church life. And, and we come and we interact, and we, 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 we're there with our, with our spouse, but we're also there with others, and we get to learn and hear of their stories and how they met and how they progressed through their relationship, and it's always just a really, really wonderful time that we get to have together. And one part of that, this, uh, this past Friday night, was this um, time where Dave Menzel came and shared. Um, he talked about the commitment of love, and he gave some perspective on the marriage ritual that I really want you guys to hear this morning, because it sets the stage wonderfully for as we step into Song of Solomon this morning. So Dave, come on up. I want you to share. Thank you, sir. I did have the privilege and the opportunity to share Friday evening with the couples that were there. Um, one of the, the tricks, the tips that I can give you about properly interpreting scripture is that you have to interpret scripture based on the historic culture of the time. We cannot cram biblical truth into America 2014. And so one of the things I shared is we were looking at Ephesians chapter five, husbands love your wives, 
was when that mandate was set, marriage was an arranged marriage. The fathers would get together while the children were still very, very young and would decide, my daughter's going to marry your son. And it was an arranged marriage. And the kids did not know, were not aware of who their parents had struck up a deal with. In fact, it was the discretion of the groom's father as to when that would take place. That's why Jesus says when he likens the kingdom of heaven, no one knows the time and the day except the father. It was because it was the father's choice. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, I speak of a mystery uh, regarding the church and that the marriage relationship and the relationship between Jesus and his church is much like the marriage relationship. And no one knows when Jesus is coming for his bride except the father. So there's a picture there that we must know, we must be aware of how the marriage relationship actually worked. It was an arranged marriage. And no one knew except the father of the groom when that was going to take place. And so it would probably end up something like this, guys, you would finish a day of work, whatever you were doing, or your, you know, carpenter out in the, the work in the herds, whatever. And while you're working your day away, the father would call the most trusted servant and he would whisper in his ear, say, go home, kill the fatted calf, call the wedding guests together. Today, my son's getting married. Guys, you know nothing's coming. Ladies, you are clueless at this point. So they would head on home and when they got home, the wedding feast, the wedding guests had arrived and dad would look at his son with that face that only a dad can and go, guess what, son? Today's your lucky day. Hey, you're getting married. Ladies, you still don't know anything about it. So they would get the wedding party together. The son would get washed up, dressed, ready to go, and they'd come walking down the street. Son still doesn't know where the wedding party's going. The only one that knows is the father. And they're heading down the street. Ladies. You still don't know what's coming. And can you picture it? I mean, you know, I'm a guy in the, back of, in the back of my mind. I'm thinking about this. I can see the sun going, yeah, Dad, down there. I saw her at the well. Yeah, down there. Oh, come on, Dad. And they'd go a little further. No, no, not down there, Dad. I've seen her at market. No, no, no. You know, I could just see this going on in this guy's mind. He has no idea who he's going to marry. And they finally get within the appointed range and the father calls the trusted servant up and the servant is told. And the servant runs ahead of the wedding party and he knocks on the door and he says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Ladies, you now know. And if you're not packed and on the porch when the wedding party arrives, you're left behind. Because it's your job to be ready. That's why the whole parable where Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to ten virgins. And five have oil for their lamps and five don't. Because that father-in-law had a weird sense of humor. He showed up in the middle of the night. Five of them had oil in their lamps. And they were able to go to the porch and meet the bridegroom. The other five didn't have oil. They were left. And Jesus uses that as a picture of our anticipation for Jesus coming. So the bride's at the porch. She meets the bridal party. They go back to mom and dad's house, his mom and dad's house, with the entire bridal party. And the bridegroom takes his new bride into mom and dad's bedroom to consummate the marriage while the wedding party waits outside. No pressure here, folks. And it isn't until the couple comes back out from the bedroom and the groom says that he accepts the bride, not based upon her appearance or anything else, but by the cultural proof of her purity and her virginity at the time, he accepts the bride and they are now a married couple. That's a wedding. That would be tough. And what I shared with them Wednesday night, and I just or Friday night, and I want to share with you real quick as I close. To that man who didn't know, who never saw his wife, 
until he lifted the veil in his parents' bedroom. God commands him to love her as much as he loves himself, as much as he loves his own body, and as much as Christ loves the church. Now, if God commands that of him, men, how much more does God expect out of us when we got to pick them? Appreciate it, brother. I believe that um, having a biblical discussion about love and marriage and sex is important. God is not silent on these matters, and unfortunately, neither is the world around us. There are polar opposite viewpoints that are displayed. There's purity and commitment and integrity on one side. And then on the other side, gratuitous fulfillment, cheap entertainment for the moment on the other. One culture demonstrates that, that God says sex is good, and the other side says that sex is God. Song of Solomon is where we pick up our story today in chapter 3 and verse 6. And we're going to read a, a significant passage of scripture this morning as we walk through. But Song of Solomon, chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. And what we see here is the picture of what Dave began to share with you about what happens in this, in this wedding procession. Verse 6, chapter 3. What is coming up from the wilderness is like columns of smoke, scented with myrrh and frankincense from every fragrant flower of the merchant. It is Solomon's royal litter surrounded by 60 warriors from the mighty of Israel. All of them are skilled with swords and trained in warfare. So here's a clue. When you're going to get married, you need to be prepared. You need to have some strong folks beside you. Mighty for battle, because battle it may be. Each has his own sword at his side to guard and against the terror of the night. King Solomon has made a sedan chair for himself with wood from Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior is inlaid with love by the young women of Jerusalem. See, this is the wedding party, and they're coming to pick up the bride. They're coming to get her. They're riding on, on, Roy, on, on Solomon's royal coach, and, and they come and they get her, and there's a throne with the poles. And you've seen these kind of events in, in movies and whatnot. It's a huge deal. It's a big procession. Solomon is coming to get his bride. He's a strong man, as evidenced by his 60 mighty warriors. He's a wealthy man, as suggested by the, the pomp and circumstance. He can provide and he can protect his bride. And then the bride says, verse 11, Come out, young women of Zion, and gaze at King Solomon, wearing the crown his mother placed on him the day of his wedding, the day of his heart's rejoicing. She's saying, that's my man. Check him out. All the women in town, yeah, you're going to be jealous. That's my guy. That's my man. She's lucky. She's fortunate. She's excited. And he feels the same way. Notice the end of, of verse 11. It says, it's his heart's rejoicing as well. It's mutual. This is the best day of his life. This is the best day of her life. This is the wedding day. It's the beginning of great things to come. As we step into to chapter 4, we see how Solomon begins to handle the situation. They've moved from the, the bridal procession to the bridal feast to the, to the, to the wedding moment to the, to the time where they get to experience one another. Chapter 4, verse 1. Listen, men. He says, How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful behind your veil. Now, my wife this morning uh, allowed me to bring her wedding veil. Now, when I place this upon my head, you will probably see the ugliest bride ever. All right, here we go. All right, maybe something like this. I know it, it probably goes the other way. My wife gave me lessons time and time again on how it goes. I think it's something like this. But when we got married in 1994, evidently that was more of the style than, than, than with the, 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 the veil draped over your face. But y'all y'all, y'all, seen this. Y'all have experienced this, those of you that are married. Maybe you, you had this where, where, where you have the, the veil here, and then you have the time where, where, where Dad gives you away, and they throw back the veil, right? All right, this is probably getting a little silly, so I'll stop. But, but this is the moment, and, 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 and you know, we can see through this kind of veil, but, but the veil that we're talking about for this culture was, was, was what's much greater, and, and, and it left more to be, to be, to be revealed, right? And so, so there's a, a, a drawing back of the veil, and he can fully see her face. 
Maybe, maybe before now, you, you, you've seen photographs of, of, of Middle Eastern culture, and, 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 and basically all you can see of the ladies sometimes is just the, the, the eyes and, 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 and how beautiful her eyes are. Not, not, like, not like livestock, remember. Not like that. We, we don't say that. But, but how beautiful are her eyes? I mean, that's, maybe that's all he's seen, but he draws back the veil. And remember Dave talking about this just a second ago? This is, this is kind of the moment of truth. And then he goes on to say, your hair, your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down, down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a, a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up, washing, each one having a twin and not one missing. She's looking good. You got nice hair, you got pretty teeth. You know, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a, an adoration mixed with an inspection. But, 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 but that marriage was transactional. Okay? And so he's checking her out. Guys, it's okay to check her out. Ladies, it's okay to be checked out. Verse 3. Your lips are like a scarlet cord. Your mouth is lovely. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David constructed in layers. A thousand bucklers are hung on it. All of them shields of warriors. Now, I don't exactly understand the, 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 um, the phraseology there. I don't exactly understand um, other than... The tower, I don't know, maybe this is the vertebrae of her spine. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know the whole connection with the towers and the bucklers. and I don't know. All I really know is this. He likes what he sees. She's beautiful. She's sexy. She's awesome. He likes. Solomon is talking to her. He's speaking to her. He's building her up. He's romancing her. Remember last week? Remember last week in, in, in chapter 2, we, we see where, where she was hiding in the cleft of a rock. And, and he was satisfied with just hearing her voice, just seeing her face, just knowing her. Well, this is the next step. This is the next step. Not only is he knowing her as a person, but they are getting to become one together. Solomon has removed her veil, her hair and her eyes and her mouth and her teeth and her cheeks and her neck. And then, verse 5, your breasts are like two fawns. Twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. This is the first time that he's seen her. And he's in awe. Before the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will make my way to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are absolutely beautiful, my darling, with no imperfection in you. I just want to dwell on that just for a second. No imperfection in you. How do you say that to another person? How do you say it and mean it and know it and live it? How do you say that? The only way you can say that to your spouse, on your honeymoon, in your marriage day to day, is if you don't have anything to compare it to. You don't look at porn, you don't engage in improper relationships, because when you do, you're creating comparisons. No one can live up to those comparisons, because it's an amalgamation of all the things seen and thought and desired. We have a responsibility in healthy, holy relationships to be able to say to him, to her, you are perfect. God made her this way, made him this way, and you're perfect. Here's the truth. In a world of comparisons, your spouse will always lose. Always. They'll always lose because they're not ideal at every moment of every day. And when you live in a world of comparisons, when you can go shopping for what you want to see, what you want to experience, when you want to experience, you can always get them, get it, get that image, get that feeling in the best way without any strings, without the bad day, without. But when we live in holy, healthy relationships, that means we've seen her. We've seen her with the Coke bottle glasses in the morning. We've seen him after an Italian meal. Listen, folks, we have to starve. We have to starve ourselves of the images. We have to starve ourselves of the partners from which we would draw comparison. 
whether it's seeing our spouse being alone with them for the first time or the thousandth time. He is perfect. She is perfect. That's God's design for you and I, for couples, for marriage, for love, for intimacy, for romance. Perfection. To glory in that perfection and to thank God for that perfection. We have to decide. We have to decide, folks, much like this couple that we see here, we're going to put our full and complete energy into them. Verse 8 goes on to tell us, Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. With me from Lebanon, descend from the peak of Amana, from the summit of Sinor, from Hermon, and the dens of the lions, and from the mountains of the leopards. You have captured my heart, my sister, my bride. And just as a second here, because I don't want this thing to be a weird thing, my sister there is referring to a spiritual connection, not a, a biological connection. It's kind of the same thing as us being brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a connectivity there. The Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word there is actually a word that means you complete me. So the next time you're thinking to yourself, I'm one of those people that, that hears phrases and automatically think movie lines. Yes, that's from the movie Jerry Maguire. It was kind of famous. You complete me. It was a really cheesy thing. But Hollywood steals stuff from the Bible. Do you know that? Because it's good stuff. You complete me. Bride, you complete me. You have captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful your love, my sister, my bride. Your love is much better than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any balsam. Your lips drip the honeycomb, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments are like the fragrance of Lebanon, my sister, my bride. You are a locked garden, locked garden, a sealed spring, a locked garden. In other words, he says, you're a virgin. I know it, which is completely anti-cultural to today. I realize that. He says that you're a virgin, and he celebrates that fact. Remember, it was kind of a combination, inspection and adoration. I realize that that's not always celebrated today, to not be known until your wedding day. In our culture, people have been playing house, and when they get to their wedding day, all they have is the ceremony. There's no honeymoon. That happened a long time ago. We've gotten it all out of order. And I don't say that to, to cast a, a stone in any way, but I say that to help us realize that we are so far from God's plan for us. But we do have hope that we can return. We can lay a strong foundation for healthy, holy relationships. We can begin with our relationship with Christ and look for people who have that same passion and same desire. People that love Jesus with all their hearts and want to follow him. We can lay a firm foundation, laying out expectations, verbally committing, and then practicing what we say in our relationships. Verse 13 goes on to tell us, Your branches are a paradise of pomegranates, with the choices of fruit, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, with all the best spices. You are a garden spring, a well of flowing water streaming from Lebanon. They're enjoying one another. The fragrance, the being together. This is, this is, this is their time of, of foreplay. They are, they are gathering together. They're joining heart and mind and soul. And you remember maybe the last couple of weeks we've talked about these moments when, when passions arise, when, when hormones rage, and there becomes a moment of truth, and, and, and she has put on the brakes in chapter 1 and chapter 2. But here, here she gives herself fully. He has offered himself completely. We hear the wife speak for the first time in this chapter. Verse 16, Awaken, north wind, come, south wind, Blow on my garden, spread the fake fragrance of its spices. Let my love come to his garden and eat its choice fruits. Now is the time, this is good, and the garden is all yours. We are together. She is receptive to his advances and his romances. There is an invitation and there is expectation. It's more than just those raging hormones. It's more than selfish desire. It is passion that is fueled by love that's built on a foundation of strength foundation that is healthy and holy because God is in the center of it. This is the love that was meant to be. Then we turn the page to chapter 5. 
And we'll leave with this, with this last verse. And this is, this is kind of a, a past tense aspect of, of, of the moment. And so after we've said, she, he said nine times how she is his. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 5. I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh and my spices. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink. Be intoxicated with love. They've had their, their moment of consummation. They've come back out to celebrate with their friends, and they want their friends to celebrate their love with them. Drink, drink, be intoxicated with love. And I need to tell you, that's my prayer for each and every one of us couples. That's the prayer for my life, and I believe that's the healthy, holy prayer for each and every one of us as we look to our marriages and our relationships, that we can, we can, we can be intoxicated with love. And, that, and, and this is the phrase that I love here. We can eat our honey, eat my honeycomb with my honey. I know you've always heard you can have your cake and eat it too, or you can't have your cake. I think that's the stupidest phrase ever. If you have cake, what do you do with it? You eat it. If you have honeycomb, hopefully it has honey on it. But the way I kind of read this is I can have my honeycomb with my, with my honey. You know what I'm saying? Do, do, do y'all have pet names for each other? We did this on Friday night at the, at the Valentine's deal. Pet names. Now, the, 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 the biggest and best pet names that Caroline and I have for, our, for, for each other is, is, is this. She calls me Barfield. And I call her woman. I know those are terms of endearment. Maybe terms of frustration. But that's, that's kind of our, 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 our pet names for one another. Um, earlier on in our marriage, one of the pet names that I had for Caroline was, was HBO and not the network. She used to eat all the time cereal, honey bunches of oats. And so somewhere in my weird mind, that turned into HBO. But, but it, it kind of helps me connect this whole have my honeycomb with my honey. When, 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 when you, you, you have your honey with your honey, with your squeeze, with your sweetie, that's the whole point. You, you, this is who you have it with. You don't have it with somebody else. You don't, you don't, you don't, have, have, honey with, you don't have honey with sweetie. You have sweetie with sweetie and honey with honey. You have her. This is who you have. This, you have him. That's who you have. You don't have this with somebody else. That's what healthy, holy relationships are all about. Physically, mentally, spiritually, so you're together. You're not looking for somebody else to do something else with. It's him. It's her. That's what we do. That's the whole point is to be with him. Be with her in that marriage relationship. God has ordained this thing called marriage. He's ordained this thing that we call sex, and they're great. God doesn't shy away from talking about these things, and we shouldn't either, church. It's important to have healthy relationships in the church so that we can be healthy outside of these walls, in the places that we go, with the conversations that we have, with the people that we know that don't have healthy, holy, happy relationships that are based upon a Christ relationship. It's important because the world is watching whether you believe it or not. We live in a 24-7 in a media world, but it's a, small, it's a much smaller scrutiny than that because there's somebody always watching you, always listening to you, whether, whether it's your interactivity in social media like Twitter and Facebook or whether it's in actual social interactivity with you and you. People are watching you to see how you act, see how you talk, see how you love one another, see how you're real, see how you parent because of the commitment that you have. The world is watching us, church, and we've got to get this right. You may be thinking to yourself, well, I didn't get it right. But you have an opportunity now to start now. Build that foundation. You've been married, or you're going to get married. Maybe you won't, but is the desire in those relationships to honor God as we develop the interpersonal, the romantic relationship that we have with our spouse we have to identify with one another belonging to one another it's important it's essential it establishes the commitment that we have put our trust in one another it lays the groundwork even as I said for our children's understanding of what commitment is like 
the reason we have more and more young adults living in their romantic relationships the way they have them is because they've seen improper relationships model for them time and time again. It may not have been mom and dad, or it may have been mom and dad. Or it may have been the television, it may have been the movie. There, there's lots of influences, but it's, it's, it's surely this. If we don't tell, if we don't show, how will they know? We must live out with proof of our relationships. Church, the world outside looks to us. People that are far from Christ look to us and they say, that relationship, him, her, what, what, what they do together, that, that's amazing. They've been through so much. They've had so much pain. They've had the struggle. They've, they've walked through this. Their kid, how do they do that? It's because they have developed a strong foundation based upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who we are, church. That's part of the hope that we have to offer in sharing Jesus is the relationship solidity that we have, the healthy, holy relationships, marriages that we develop. So here's my challenge. Here's, here's what I believe that we have to do. Married couples, whether you started right or wrong, whether you brought baggage into the relationship, pain from other places, you have to make a choice to live with the solid footing that you know you can put in place when you have a godly relationship. I think the Bible tells us the way that we begin setting things right, the way that we wipe the slate, the way that we, we move back to the, to the, to the default, to the, to the clean mode, is that we confess our sins. We confess our sins to God, and God has promised to forgive us. We begin there on the level playing ground, and then we ask forgiveness of him or her if there's an issue that's been wrong. And then we decide together to move forward as a couple, as married people, with a commitment, first to God, but second to one another, letting nothing come in between. We have to rid ourselves of the comparisons. We've got to drop them, get rid of them, cut them out. Whatever they may be, it's got to stop. If you need help, get help. If that's accountability, if that's counseling, it has to happen. Help is essential for those personal relationships to move forward. If you're singles today, if you're, if you're acting married, you've got to stop. We can't play house. That's not what the Bible teaches us for healthy, holy relationships. I know it's painful. I know it's difficult. But in the end, you have to decide, is she or is he worth it? And then put the building blocks in place for that healthy, holy relationship. Sacrificing, maybe, the intimacy for the moment, the pleasure for the moment, for the person of a lifetime, that forever person, because forever is what we're looking at. That's what marriage is. Marriage is forever. I had a friend of mine on, on, on Facebook this week um, made a post, and I, and I know he's, uh, he's struggling. He's struggling with, with relationship stuff. And, and this was his post. He said, um, I have been trying to figure out this forever thing, but by looking at some people's relationships, I figured out what forever is. It's about three to six weeks. That's not forever, folks. Three to six weeks is not forever. It's not just now. It's forever. Forever. We have to build in safeguards in our lives, people around us that will hold us accountable for our actions, for our thoughts, for our directions. The Bible is very real. It's very practical. It's very, some people would say earthy. I had a pastor friend once that called it earthy. It is. The Bible deals with the things that we deal with if we'll take the time to read God's word and to discover what it is that he has to say. It's not that God has an opinion about everything. God just knows everything. And he gives us an opportunity to, to, to glean from that wisdom the Song of Solomon lays out a pattern of healthy, holy, romantic relationships, but it also tells a story in capsule of what the entire Bible is all about. God has an ideal for every one of us, for all of us. He has an ideal romance for all of us. He has an ideal love for all of us. But along the way, you and I, we found a way to mess that up, whether it was through pride or disobedience, selfishness, or... or just we kind of lump it under the whole category of sin. We've messed it up. 
But God, not in a weird, weird romantic way, but God teaches us using language of romance because that's what we understand. We are drawn to understanding relationships. And so he uses relationships to teach us about himself and the great love that he has for, him, has for us. He cherishes you. He thinks you are beautiful. He thinks you're amazing. We can learn a lot about relationships, about starting marriages, about enriching marriages, rekindling romance, redefining love with him, with her. We can learn about the love story of our lives if we'll dig into what God's word says. Each and every one of us is like that bride, waiting for that bridal party to come, waiting for that procession to come down the road and pick us, to whisk us away to have the happily ever after. Well, here's the news, the good news. You don't have to wait anymore. God's knocking at your door, and he chooses you. He picks you. He loves you. And that's the the picture of the story that we get throughout Scripture. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus, his son, to die for you so that you can be his forever. And it's because of that relationship, it's because of that relationship that we're able to have right relationship with God. And consequently, we're able to have right relationship with one another when we lay the foundation, when we set principles in place and we follow those principles. God wants us to honor him in our romance. God wants us to to honor him as we have Christ in our lives. And Jesus wants to be invited in to your life. If you know that you need that start today, I, I challenge you, I'd invite you see that need and ask Christ into your heart. If you're in a relationship this morning that that you know that you know is not as pure, it's not as holy as it needs to be, and you need to to reset some boundaries, you need to to, to rekindle a romance that was lost, I'd ask you to to pray about that, to begin to to take steps, take measures to reintroduce yourself to one another, couples. If you're in one of those relationships that's, that's outside the confines of what God lays out as healthy and holy, you need to take a long look at where you need to go with that. How you need to, to take a step first toward Jesus, but second toward setting out clear, specific, holy advances toward your romance, toward your relationship life. But none of that will begin if you can't set things right with Jesus first. And that's my prayer. That we have marriages, we have relationships in this church, in churches around this city, in in homes around this country and around this world that have Christ at the center of them. Because unless that happens, we will not see relationships that honor commitment, that believe in the the sanctity of marriage. We We won't find those relationships unless it begins with us. And it begins with Christ in us. Let me pray for you, church. Father God, this morning, we, we want to celebrate marriage. We want to be like, like the, the folks at the, at the feast, God, after the wedding moment, God, that celebrate, God, that we're intoxicated with love. God, let us live out our lives eating honeycomb with our honey. God, let us believe that you have the truth that God, that you have the, the, the way for us to understand what relationships really need to be about. Father, help us to, to get rid of the comparisons. God, help us to, to understand what commitment really means. God, help us to be the right one for the right one. God, let us live the solution to the love problem. Because God, not only does, does that solution bless us, but God, it honors you. And God, it, it Not only does it honor you and does it bless us, but God, it blesses the people around us as they see what true romance is, as they see what love really is all about, as they see marriage and family. God, help us today to to live that out, to search that out, to embody those principles. Father, this morning, bring each and every one of us to a moment of commitment, a moment of realization God just in the in the silence show each of us not 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 where we fail God not 
but show us where we can take a step forward. Because, God, we all fail. God, convict us. Convince us. Show us, Father, where we need to take changes, to make changes in our lives, in our relationships. God, help us to understand that first change has to be our relationship with you. Maybe for the first time, God, we, we accept you. We accept Jesus as Lord of our lives, as Savior of our souls. God, if that's, that's one today, Father, I, I pray you pull strongly on that heart to draw them close to you, to get that relationship right first. Father, for others of us that are here today, that, that we've, we've, we've made that commitment, God. We follow you, but God, our, our, our romance, our marriage, our dating, Father, it does not honor you. Father, show us. Show us how, how to be the one for the one. God, help us to, to, to live lives of integrity that are built upon the truth of your scripture. Father, help us to learn to be the person that they need us to be as we have submitted to Christ in our lives. God, there may be some of us here today and we'll be thinking, thinking to ourselves, wow, we, 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 we did this thing, this relationship pretty right. We're, we're, we're scoring like a 95, 98%. God, help us to celebrate those couples that have placed you first and foremost and God are learning to love and lean and date each other continually, building romance day after day. God, help us to, to look to those men and women, those couples, as examples of your godly love for us and the godly love that we need to have for one another in our relationship. God, I just want to pray right now for some that are here this morning that are on the verge, that are on the brink. God, that are about to throw their hands up because he's too much or she's too little. God, we, we get our perspectives kind of all out of whack when we don't have you at the center of our relationship. But God, I pray for those couples that are in trouble, that are going down a path that's very slippery, that's very dangerous. Maybe, God, a path that's had comparisons. God, a path that's had history. God, a path that continues to keep score. God, I pray for those marriages. God, I pray first and foremost that, that you show out. God, that you show up. And God, that you save marriages. God, you save families. God, I pray for that man that's too strong to ask for help. God, I pray for that woman today. I pray for that woman today that's hiding. God, I pray for that couple that's afraid. I pray for the ones that are lonely, the ones that are heartbroken. God, only you provide healing. Only you provide healing. God, I ask today that you allow our marriages to flourish, our families to blossom and grow. God, I, I ask you this morning to, to rain down upon this place, upon these people, upon this church, and churches all over, couples all, that seek to honor you, God. I pray, pray for your blessings in their lives. I pray for a richness in their romance and their passion. God, this morning, I ask you to rekindle. Rekindle fires that may have burnt down to just the smallest coals. God, let them burn brightly. God, let them burn as, as torches for one another, but God, in your name. God, we love you and we thank you for, for your words, for your example. God, with your help, we can be the one that we need to be for the one that we need to be with. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.